Let's talk about some of the folks that, that surrounded him uh, in general, in, in, in at least the recent years and the allegations that we've been seeing in some of the civil complaints. Very interesting folks. It's not uh, like your A-list of celebrities that you used to see uh, when we would you know, see Diddy's parties where there would be all sorts of anybody and everybody coming and going. And not to say that any of those people were involved in the darker end of Diddy, but some of these allegations from Rodney Jones and and some of the people that he lists in it as kind of Diddy's, uh, you know, I don't know, say groupies or wh- whatever it would be, his, his entourage. Um, their Their willingness to do anything for Diddy pretty much on demand is really kind of disturbing, especially when you get into the sexual behavior that we were reading about in that civil lawsuit. There's there's one uh, character, and uh, her name escapes me, uh, but basically, the, it, to summarize it, it was Diddy said, I want you to go over to, uh, to Rodney Jones here, who's the producer on that Love album, and I want you to go have sex with him. Uh, go and start seducing him. Uh, and it goes into great detail uh, in the uh, in the civil uh, lawsuit as exactly how she did it. But to have that mindset, to just have your boss say, "Hey, go uh, go have sex with that guy over there," you know, and and you just do it. I mean, what is going on in one's mind that that this is like okay, this is part of the job, and and then seemingly you know be be cool with it because it, the the allegations are they were laughing and. You know, they they enjoyed what they were doing. Uh, at least Rodney did not, but the the employees of Diddy seemed to to enjoy this. I I can only um, imagine that somebody who, by choice, who was not being coerced, but somebody by choice who attached themselves to a person like this, the person that we believe him to be at this point, um, they have got to have a, a tremendous need inside to be important and to have a sense of purpose and somebody who would just not really function outside of being connected to a strong, powerful figure like that. And I don't think you or I would be that person, you know, Mm -hmm. this just sounds like an abhorrent kind of lifestyle. Um, But apparently there are lots of people who are. They're basically searching for a purpose. They want to be attached to someone. They get feelings of power from the relationship they feel important and so yeah you have people who are not well put together who become the clingers on i'm assuming it kind of goes back to what we see quite often with child predators Uh, we saw it with r kelly uh and we saw it with epstein as well of preying on those who are coming from very broken homes very bad lifestyles or very bad upbringings and are really, you know, kind of desperate for attention uh, yeah. and, and and money uh, as well. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm guessing that's where they find people like that. And when you have next to nothing and suddenly Diddy yeah. is knocking on your door or R. Kelly or Epstein, uh, it, it's, a, it's the polar opposite of the life that you're leading. But you probably also don't necessarily know the dark pits that are going on yeah. uh, with those individuals as well. Yeah, and I think folks like that are willing to sacrifice perhaps um, whatever integrity they have. They're willing to let go of it because the payoffs are so intense, whether that's the economic wealth that they're you know able to acquire from it or the attention or the fact that they want his approval and that means everything to them, the status. And so they're, they're willing to really sink to some pretty low behavior for that. What? What kind of uh, responsibility or culpability do they have? I mean, once this continues to go all down, they're adults. They're making adult choices. Um, I mean, can it be argued that they were coerced into this, that they were brainwashed? Are they victims of Diddy as well? Or is it just, look, you're an adult. You made adult choices as well. And it turns out you, you sexually assaulted somebody when they didn't want you to be doing that. Right. I I think, you know, it's probably going to be looked at on a case by case basis. If there were legal things, people did things that were illegal. Certainly they did things that were immoral and unethical. But there's also the um, issue of trauma bonding. Mm -hmm. And if there was someone who was abused in some way, even emotionally abused, were they bonded in a way 
that we would consider, um, okay, this was a victimization here. And so that's always possible. And you see that a lot with, with women, you know, who yeah. have been sexually abused and exploited, but, but then they feel, well, 90% of the time he's good to me or 90% mm -hmm. of the time, this is a nice relationship. And so they attach in a very deep way to someone who's really doing bad things and causing them to do bad things. Does the trauma have to occur between the individual who's doing the bad things for that person and that person? Or can it be something where it happened earlier in life and then, you know, Diddy comes along as the savior type figure, if you will? They could be prone to having that kind of trauma bonding happen pretty readily if they had a pre-existing history of trauma. But I think even without that, in the right circumstances, lots and lots of people can experience trauma bonding. And it's very confusing for them because if you have a very manipulative predator who is, uh, you know, um, coercing people in, in ways of making them feel valued, making them feel important, giving them money you know, building them up, but then in other ways, knocking them down, making them feel terrible about themselves, they will then blame themselves for the bad treatment. And and it, it, this can be a pattern from someone's childhood, but it could start at an older age, particularly in people maybe in their teens and 20s, they would still be very prone to it. We talked about what Diddy may be going through right now mentally thinking, you know, this is all gonna, it's fine, I'm more powerful than anything, and I'm the victim here. What do you think these folks are thinking right now that, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're Diddy. They're, 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 they're man with the money that's been doing all these things with them, to them, for them. Um, uh, now is, is likely going to be facing uh, probably a life in prison uh, and the party's probably pretty close to over. Right, right. It's probably a wake up call for a lot of them. And there may be some that are still holding on to the delusion that they're gonna get out of this, or he's gonna buy his way out of this and things will be okay. That may be what's coming out of his mouth most likely. But I would think for many of them, this has gotta be um, quite a wake up call. Yeah, a wake up call and and probably very likely uh, a, a, a time to flip. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing yeah. there's a lot of people right now that are having that realization as the authorities come and knock on their door and ask to talk about what's going on. Uh, I, I that, that's an interesting thing with with this whole thing. The friends that he's kept in, in recent years, they don't really seem to be much of friends. They they seem to be more so there for the party uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and nothing else. And that's got to be a lonely world for Diddy and probably also what also uh, helped spiral this more out of control. You're, you're not mm -hmm. the big superstar you were at one time. You don't have all the people around you like you did at one time. But you got these people. Yeah. Hey, it's Tony Bruschi. If you like the podcast, be sure to like, subscribe, and press that bell so you don't miss any of our updates on the cases we're following for you right here at the Hidden Killers podcast and True Crime Today. And thanks.